This is called The Author Reflects on His 35th Birthday. 35, I've been looking forward to you for many years now, so much so that I feel you and I are old friends. And so on this day, 35, I propose a toast to me and you. 35, from this day on, I swear before the Venerable Cyrus that if I ever, if I ever try to bring out the best in folks again, I want somebody to take me outside and kick me up and down a sidewalk or sit me in a corner with a funnel on my head. Make me as hard as a rock, 35, like the fellow in the story about the big one that got away. Let me laugh my head off with Moby Dick as we reminisce about them suckers who went down with the Pequod. 35, I ain't been mean enough. Make me real, real mean. Mean as old Marie rolling her eyes. Mean as the town Bessie sings about, where all the birds sing bass. 35, make me Tennessee mean, Cobra mean, Cuckoo mean, Injun mean, Dracula mean, Beethovenian brows mean, Miles Davis mean. Don't offer assistance when quicksand is tugging some poor dope under mean. Pawnbroker mean, Pharaoh mean. That's it, 35, make me Pharaoh mean. Mean as can be, mean as Dickens, meaner than mean. When I walk down the street, I want them to whisper, there goes Mr. Mean. He's double mean. He even turned the skeletons in his closet out into the cold. And 35, don't let me trust anybody over Reed. But just in case, put a tail on that Negro, too. <laughs> this guy doesn't trust himself. Yeah. <laughs> what is this from the book Chattanooga? Mm -hmm. um, what, is, uh, what do you see as the difference uh, in your poetry in that book? What's Chattanooga as a metaphor? We explored conjure. Ch uh, Chattanooga, Chattanooga, I was, uh, Chattanooga was the seat of the Cherokee Nation. We have a lot of Cherokee relatives. And as a matter of fact, uh, when I was a kid, I was taken care of by a Cherokee woman uh, for a year. And Chattanooga is a Cherokee, Cherokee word meaning uh, the top of the mountain, the summit of Lookout Mountain. And Lookout Mountain is also a scene of one of the most important battles of the Civil War called the Battle of Above the Clouds, which was a turning point uh, in, in the, the Civil War. And uh, there are a lot of place names that are dear to me, and it's autobiographical. And uh, uh, the title poem, Chattanooga, I wrote when I really began to uh, think about place. I think what you do is you leave your hometown, you leave your, your origin, and you go out and you, uh, you know, you go out into the world, and you have a lot of experience. And then suddenly, when you get my age, you start thinking about origin, you know what I mean? And uh, I, was, I was feeling... Uh, I was thinking about, uh, you know, when I was a kid, I lived in, in back in front of the Tennessee River. Tennessee River is like down a path from where we were living. And I remember the most gorgeous sunsets uh, that you'd ever want to see. And I could see Lookout Mountain, you know, from my uh, backyard when I was a kid. So all these things, and I was thinking about my relatives who were all, you know, the people uh, who took care of me who are dead now. And, uh, you know, that was like a, a sentimental poem. You know, my parents are pioneers. You know, they uprooted themselves from Tennessee and came to Buffalo. They didn't know what to expect. A lot of people don't have that much daring. They like to be where they are. I learned more about writing, living in New York uh, for about six or seven years than I did the, at the university, actually going to poetry readings and talking to writers. And this may be the best way to do it. You get a master or something, uh, somebody I'm, like I'm studying, a, I'm, I'm talking to architects these days, interviewing architects, and they really improve my eye. I can travel around the city cities where I go to and I can identify certain roof styles and, uh, you know, certain patterns and designs, you know, houses. I wanted to get out of New York because New York was too good to me. I come up from like a very Slavic, harsh, uh, self-reliant uh, kind of town like Buffalo, you know, where people get suspicious of, of uh, things may be made too easy for them, you know. That, you know, <laughs> these are pioneers up there. You get immigrants up there and they like all the same, the blacks and the uh, Poles and the Germans and the Italians, these are very rugged people. And uh, it's a harsh town, <laughs> and it's cold in the winter. <laughs> and so I said, well, you know, I wasn't accustomed to anything like this, being treated like royalty and all this. So I said, I got to get out, get out of here and go someplace where it's really uh, rough. <coughs> you know what I mean? At 50 bucks, I went to Los Angeles and uh, held up in this, uh, on this block called uh, Echo Park Canyon, where it's a, it's a deserted street where everybody's over 90. I was the youngest. <laughs> My wife and I were the youngest people on the block, and at the bottom of it is a lake that uh, Fatty Arbuckle drained once <laughs> to do a movie, a silent movie, see? So I held up there and I wrote uh, Yellowback Radio Broke Down, which was like my first real serious attempt to write a voodoo novel. 
combining different forms like uh, the Old West, you know, the Western, and uh, uh, hoodoo. So I did the research. I started the research on a on a, a hoodoo in a, at the Los Angeles Library, and that was the beginning of it. It involves prophecy, and it involves conjuring, and it involves dance, and it involves mystery, and it involves painting, and it involves sculpture, and all the arts. It was like multimedia. And these, uh, these rites were practiced in New Orleans, in our country, in the 19th century. And I began reading uh, material on this, and I found we had a gold mine. And I've, I've, you know, I've continued getting into it, learning French, for example, and trying to read everything I can uh, put my hands on, because I think you can understand it when you talk about maybe uh, Yeats and some of the Irish poets trying to, uh, to uh, bring back their uh, mythology. I think if you go into a people's past and see what's consistent in their art, uh, you can find their mind. Do you see this as, as a particular, you know, as a in black other words, source? You lose your mind. Is this a black source? No, it's not a black source. It's a, eclectic. Hoodoo was eclectic. You have whites and, uh, and Indians in uh, South American voodoo. And voodoo is merely a term for all uh, the synthesis that took place in this country when different tribes came together. You see, you had Fonz and Fon people and uh, Ebos and uh, Angolans, Dahomeans. You know, there was no distinction when people were brought over here, brought over different tribes, and tribes that wouldn't ordinarily come in contact with each other, even in Africa, put all their skills and their mythologies and their art forms together here. And they were influenced by Indians, like in, like, uh, I understand that uh, when the uh, African uh, gods or spirit loas were brought here, they were very gentle, but they came up against Indian influence in uh, Haiti, the Haitian Indians, and they became, some became mean. <laughs> And uh, there were even white influences. For example, uh, Legba is a crossroads symbol in Africa and here. Papa Legba stands on the, uh, on, at the crossroads, and he uh, stands for the intersection of the real and the real world and the world of the invisibles. Well, this is the same thing that St. Peter does, in a sense. And so when you get here, you get St. Peter substituted for, for Legba. But that's all a, a technical discussion. Uh, what, I'm interested in, what I'm interested in here is that the Afro-American artists have been able to use the processes of this art form, which it really is, and uh, I think take it farther. So you get ragtime, the same process that led to new spirits being created in South America with no antecedents in Africa, led to ragtime here. You read an early anthology by James Waller Johnson. He said, nobody know how, knows how ragtime came about. It just, it just grew. You see, that's what I, that's why I have Jess Grew and Mumble Jumbo as being a spontaneous rising. Hoodoo is always changing and, it, and it's, al it's always adapting and it's always, it's like, it reminds you of the early white religions, which were, which were very, very similar to, uh, to Hoodoo. When, when Augustus, for example, now this is the way Hoodoo works. When Augustus heard that there was a new God, Jehovah, you know, he said, well, let's uh, put him in a palace. We worship him, too. Who cares, you know? Right. Put us, put us, more the merrier. That's where we are. Any amount of spirits, you know, any amount of art forms. We're, we're very tolerant. But you go, talking about going back in the past. Why are the 20s so important to you? Because I think uh, the, 19th, the 1920s gives a good, uh, you can, a lot of parallels between 1920s. I found all the parallels between the 1920s and the, and the 1960s that were useful to me. For example, there was a renaissance in black writing in the 1920s, yeah. so you had that there was a government scandal, and this was really before Watergate, but I had to have Harding since I was writing about the, the 20s, but it just so happens that I was juxtaposing certain uh, 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 pictures with the text, and I just luckily happened to get one of all the Watergate conspirators on a balcony <laughs> looking at a May Day <laughs> demonstration. So guilty. Yeah, right. But I had not Mitchell, Kleindienst, John Dean, uh, LaRue, one of the guy named LaRue, all of them were on a balcony, and I just put that in there. Uh, 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 u using it as a, as, a, as a background to a text about Warren Harding. <laughs> Who was more interesting, as, as, incidentally, you know? I mean, you know, Warren Harding was a libertine, you know, and if, uh, as uh, and, and, uh, Longstreet Roosevelt said, if he went up to a, one of his rooms in the White House, he might have found his mistress or the liquor bottles left and the, <laughs> and the poker cards. <laughs> you know, at least the guy was human. In, in Brazilian uh, religion, they have a, they have a figure named uh, the black man the, uh, the old black slave, and uh, people who get and whites get possessed by the old black slave, and 
certain things you do, like you have to, you smoke a cigar, and you, you walk like an old man. And the old black slave in uh, Brazilian religion represents the collective, con uh, the le collective unconscious of all the slaves who died on the crossing from Africa to here. Is that like Railroad Bill? Uh, yeah. That sort of yeah, thing. yeah, well, yeah, that kind of figure. And so we see this old wise man and heritage rising in the 70s. I think one thing I've done, I've been able to do through my research on neo-hoodooism, is that uh, a, lot of, a lot of young kids are talking to their grandparents now. A lot of young black kids are talking to their, to their grandparents, and they're going through the trunks, the family trunks, and all this kind of thing. Because in the 60s, they, they were very, people were very future-oriented because the basis of a lot of the politics of, that uh, were, you know, that we were concerned, oh, and, uh, exposed to were Marxists, you know, which is future-oriented. People call a, somebody goes back to the 20s or to the Civil War someplace to get material in this, uh, for his work and who lives in this country, that's called nostalgia. But if I went back to upstairs, downstairs, that you see on public <laughs> educational television, <laughs> or if I went back to Ken O'Clock's time, they don't call that nostalgia, they call that civilization. <laughs> and I think the reason that uh, people call it nostalgia, these people in New York call it nostalgia because they really yearn to be in another country or they yearn to be someplace else. That's why Turgenev and I don't I don't say Turgenev and these guys are not great novelists, but I hear a lot of Turgenev and Dostoevsky and uh, and uh, Kafka and all these names bandied about in New York City when we have our, our great writers in this civilization. So I think people who say that uh, you're using the, 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 the material you're using this because you're nostalgic are just people who have contempt for the uh, the American past and don't uh, don't uh, think uh, it's worthy of being treated as a serious art or being uh, useful for serious art. But see, a person like me who's had like a lot of ancestors, you know, white, Cherokee, black, buried in this country, I uh, have a different opinion about it. You know, if I can go back five generations, you know, I'm really a classical American, you know, if, uh, if I can, you know, because my people are buried here uh, and uh, I can go walk around their tombs and look at uh, their, you know, pictures and scrapbooks and things like that, then uh, I have a different feeling about uh, this. Uh, this is all I know. I don't know England and... Uh, I don't know, France. I mean, if, if, you're, if you're thinking about, I'm going to be uh, Rambo or somebody uh, all the time, or you have, uh, uh, you know, that, that can cripple somebody, you know, that, that can frustrate you. But I think, uh, like when I was in school, people said it's not a good idea to rhyme. I mean, don't rhyme. Don't, don't do any sing-song kind of rhyme stuff. And I said, oh, that may, you know, be sophisticated. Unrhyme, you know, and so I'm beginning to rhyme again. I mean, who cares, you know, and uh, I enjoy it. And sometimes other people uh, like it. Uh, this poem is called Beware Do Not Read This Poem, which guarantees the reader will read it soon. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I grabbed this off the tube, too, because I don't think you have to go to any esoteric place to find images for poetry. Tonight, Thriller was about an old woman so vain, she surrounded herself with many mirrors. It got so bad that finally she locked herself indoors, and her whole life became the mirrors. One day, the villagers broke into her house but she was too swift for them. She disappeared into a mirror. Each tenant who bought the house after that lost a loved one to the old woman in the mirror. First a little girl, then a young woman, then a young woman's husband. The hunger of this poem is legendary. It has taken in many victims. Back off from this poem. It has drawn in your feet. Back off from this poem. It has drawn in your legs. Back off from this poem. It is a greedy mirror. You are into this poem from the waist down. Nobody can hear you, can they? This poem has had you up to here. Belch, this poem ain't got no manners. You can't call out from this poem. Relax now and go with this poem. Move and roll on to this poem. Do not resist this poem. This poem has your eyes. This poem has his head. This poem has his arms. This poem has his fingers. This poem has his fingertips. This poem is a reader, and the reader, this poem. Statistic. The United States Bureau of Missing Persons reports that in 1968, over 100,000 people disappeared, leaving no solid clues, nor trace, only a space in the lives of their friends. Thank you. Sure.